Welcome to A Look Ahead. This is a study of the Sabbath School lesson as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, the final lesson in a series prepared for the second period of three months in the year of 2012. This is lesson number 13 and it's the lesson to be studied for June 30 of 2012. It's entitled, A Perpetual Ministry. Before we start discussing that, we'd like to ask you to bow your heads with us as we pray. Our kind and wonderful Father, we have been looking at a series of lessons on the challenges of witnessing, of evangelism, of reaching out to the communities around us. It has been a thought-provoking and challenging series. Be with us now as we think about how that, that process, that in each church, in each Sabbath school class can be used as a mode or a method of reaching out to others. And may we implement these things as far as possible in our individual lives and our individual groups. It's our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So how do we best witness as a group? How do we best witness as a Sabbath school class or as a local church? There are always special groups that need special attention. Um, the youth. We hear people talking about them all the time. That's great. The elderly. Those who are not attending church on a regular basis anymore. Those who do not feel that they are involved in the church program for some reason. Is there ever a time when our witnessing ministry is finished? Does God intend for each one of us to play in an ongoing part as long as we're able to be active church members? Will we be witnessing even after the close of probation? Maybe I should drop and see what you think of that. Will we be witnessing still after the close of probation? Sure, yeah. because we do not know when the close of probation will be. So well, I, no I can't say, I'm watching, okay, I can stop witnessing now. Well, Noah in the ark, the door closed. So he could no longer witness to the people outside. But when probation closes, there is not such a thing as a door closing on the ark, so... Aren't you forgetting about the angels? What angels? Don't we still witness to them? The great controversy. Oh, so even during uh, the plagues we're witnessing to the angels? We're well, witnessing about God. What about even yeah. after, after the new earth? Um, if there should be some new creations, might we witness to them? Yes. But is there witnessing a Good lifestyle? Point. Well, I mean, that's one of the questions. In this quarter, we've talked about witnessing by your lifestyle. We've talked a lot about witnessing by personally actually talking to people, even casual contacts. We've talked about all kinds of different ways that we can witness as groups. Yeah. Now, was Jesus forever witnessing when he was on earth? And when he is in heaven, is he still forever witnessing? Yes, witnessing to the truth about his Father. And so that's our model. Mm -hmm. Matter of fact, he stays human throughout eternity as a witness for what went on. Is there, is there an excuse for taking a break once in a while and just saying, I'm burned out? I'm going to go work on my stamp collection. There you go. <laughs> well, when, when you are burnt out, you might be a terrible witness. So mm -hmm. it is good to keep yourself fresh and happy and... Well, that's a little bit like saying, I'm burnt out on life. I'm going to quit life. All that depression. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, do you think the Apostle Paul ever took a break? Well, did Jesus take breaks? Do you take Jesus? breaks? Do you take breaks? I think. No. You don't take breaks? You take Not vacations even. all the time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> about, four, <laughs> about four a year. <laughs> I'm busy working on my lessons while I'm on my vacation. Uh -huh. That's why we have to tape some of these broadcasts way in advance. Yeah. Jesus <laughs> took breaks by his full nights in prayer. Mm -hmm. And he came forth more refreshed, refreshed. to begin a new day. Mm -hmm. The full very the intensity of his work. I mean, he was out in front in the, um, in the arena there, preaching, 
He took he some also food. supported himself, so he talked with the customers probably. He's a little different. Mm -hmm. Also did some traveling too. Exactly. Oh, he took some I force breaks, well, didn't he? He took some that force too. breaks <laughs> later in his life, and then he witnessed to the jailers. Yeah. I mean, Actually, the witnessing was probably easier than the than the work and the and the traveling. Yeah. I don't Probably think more. we're supposed to all be like Paul. Actually, the, the witnessing is, is invigorating, life-giving. Mm -hmm. uh, he, he did it at all levels. Well, Paul clearly had a fire burning in his bones. He could not keep quiet about <clears throat> what he believed. Do we have that kind of fire burning in our bones? Absolutely not. Not like we should. It's, it's kind of ambers as we get older. I see. <laughs> and, and how do we get that kind of fire started in the lives of somebody else? Show me it happening, and I'll tell you. We we don't we I don't I don't know how you know where's the Holy Spirit in all of this? Yeah, you know the Holy Spirit is standing by. He's ready for action. We, I'm, I'm not sure I'm comfortable with all of this works orientation. We feel we have to do. <laughs> if we're excited and interested about God. People will be curious, yeah. and people want enthusiasm in their lives. They don't want humdrum, so it's up to us to learn about God and to keep enthusiasm for God by learning His different facets that we, it's sort of like discovering something, and scientists always like to discover, so we should always like to discover something new about God and then mm -hmm. uh, share it. Well, in this series of lessons, it has been almost assumed, I want you to think about this carefully, that an active church member is ready to be saved. Is that true? Did the Pharisees think they were active church members? Absolutely. Does salvation automatically come from church membership? <coughs> There'll be a group at the end who say, Lord, we uh, preached in your name and we did cast miracles and we cast out devils. Did they, think they were, did they think they were okay? Matthew 7, 22, 23. Go away, I never knew you, Jesus will say. Well, the Christian churches have had at least some active members since the days when Jesus was here on this earth, and he, has not been, he was not able to come yet. Seventh-day Adventists have had active church members since our church was first officially founded in 1863. But Jesus has not come back yet. What needs to happen before the second coming can take place? Is God waiting for a certain number of people to respond? Do we need to set our goal not only on bringing members into the church, but also preparing them to be a part of the 144,000? How can we prepare them to be a part of the 144,000? And let's look at these verses so that you won't think I'm just singing kind of a, some kind of a song over here in the bushes. 2 Peter 3, 10 to 12. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. On that day, the heavens will disappear with a shrill noise. The heavenly bodies will burn up and be destroyed, and the earth with everything in it will vanish. Since all these things will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people should you be? Your lives should be holy and dedicated to God. As you wait for the day of God and do your best, do your best to make it come soon. Who's doing their best to make it come soon? Us. The day when the heavens will burn up and be destroyed and the heavenly bodies will be melted by the heat. But we wait for what God has promised, new heavens and a new earth, where righteousness will be at home. How do you know if we're doing our best or not? It looks like we're saying, oh, since God didn't come, we're not doing our best. That's the kind of logic that we're doing yep. right now. So is that true? Yes. You think that's true? That's true. Uh, I'm not so sure about that. But Revelation 7, let's read on. After this I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds so that no wind should blow on the earth or on the sea or against any tree. And I saw another angel coming up from the east with the seal of the living God. He called out in a loud voice to the four angels to whom God had given the power to damage the earth and the sea. The angel said, Do not harm the earth, the sea, or the trees until we mark the servants of our God with a seal on their foreheads. That's what he's waiting for. Now, it said, till we mark the servants on their heads, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. That's not talking about us. Till we mark the ones that are worthy to be sealed. Yeah. So, what point are you making with that one? I'm saying, 
when there's a group who are worthy to be sealed. We talked about this last week. No, it said it, when they're finished marking the people. And I'm saying they will finish when... You, you think they're delaying? Why would they delay? No, 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 no. I'm just going by what you read there. Yeah? And, I'm, and I'm, I'm asking you. I'm, you're, I'm, you're I'm, not trying, I'm not yeah. trying to add anything yeah. to it. Well, I, I would kind of ask that question too, Ken. Um, <clears throat> are, are the things that are causing the delay today the same things that caused the delay the first time when Jesus came? Um, but or, and, and, and is there something called the fullness of time? Um, and what about the parable of the, of the, the uh, groom being delayed? It was almost like a prophecy. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, a nation doesn't go to war until its army's ready. And so how can God go into this final conflict unless his army is ready? Yeah. And, and if we're just sort of sitting on our duffs and uh, not preparing ourselves, uh, it's kind of hard for God to say, get up and march. We'll go like, well. He could have solved this whole thing without us at all. But he chose to do it this way so that we have a chance to build a character. And I, I would read a passage we've read before, but let me just read it. Had Adventists, this is found in Evangel Book of Evangelism by Ellen White, page 695, paragraph 3. Had Adventists, after the great disappointment in 1894, held fast their faith and followed on unitedly in the opening providence of God, receiving the message of the third angel and in the power of the Holy Spirit proclaiming it to the world, they would have seen the salvation of God, the Lord would have wrought mightily with their efforts, the work would have been completed and Christ would have come ere this to receive his people to their reward. Now those, I believe, were God's words. But in the period of doubt and uncertainty that followed the disappointment, many of the Advent believers yielded their faith. Thus the work was hindered and the work was, world was left in darkness. Had the whole Adventist body united upon the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus, how widely different would have been our history. It was not the will of God that the coming of Christ should be thus delayed. God did not design that his people, Israel, should wander 40 years in the wilderness. He promised to lead them directly to the land of Canaan, establishing them there, a holy, healthy, happy people. But those to whom it was first preached went not in because of unbelief. Their hearts were filled with murmuring, rebellion, and hatred, and he could not fulfill his covenant with them. I think the same story. Well, let me just read the last paragraph here. For 40 years did unbelief, Murmuring and rebellion shut out the ancient Israelites from the land of Canaan. The same sins have delayed the entrance of modern Israel into the heavenly Canaan. Well, that's the same, it's the same problem, generation after generation after generation Is after it ever generation. Come to an end? Well, there was a man <clears throat> at the ASI convention uh, last weekend that went into the history of uh, the Adventists after it was at 1844 or whatever. And it was amazing how time after time after time, there was like faction, 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 fighting, fighting, conflict, yeah. conflict, until they finally shipped Ellen White to Australia, you know, so they take a long vacation and get out of here. So it's been a history of they had their marching orders, they had what, what supposedly was right, and they didn't march together in that. They started fracturing and fighting. And have we stopped fracturing and fighting? No. Now we're fighting over the internet. I mean, you know, people so arguing. It, it and sounds like, it sounds like we <coughs> have the same conditions and we're expecting a different result. You know, even, even Moses had the same problem. He was out there for 40 years yep. and we're here on the brink and he hauls off and whacks that stone. Mm -hmm. Not once, but twice in anger. Yes. So, you know, what hope is there for me? What hope is there for the, you know, how, how what's it, what's it going to take to, so it, how, it, how, it, if it, Moses can't get that all organized, and he, you know, he even spoke face to face with God, 
how in the world are the rest of us going to well, finally see, get over that hump? But you have the advantage of looking at his <clears throat> experience. And you have the whole Bible. You can look at the experience of the life of Christ. You have more information available to you than you can possibly digest. But, so, it, uh, but that doesn't change the old human nature. Well, but if that doesn't, if, if getting to know God through the material that he's made available to us, if that doesn't work, nothing will. Well, in reading this history, there should be a group that learns from it, gets together, mm -hmm. stops the bickering, mm -hmm. marches forth with the truth, and that's all God needs. He needs mm -hmm. to stop the bickering. that's true ever since Adam and Eve. <laughs> it just hasn't happened. Are we going to let our generation pass and do nothing? Well, That's I, the question. I think there is something that God will do that he has never done before. What's he waiting for? What's he waiting for? Yes. He is waiting for, he can look all through eternity and find out all, all the questions that are ever going to come up. Mm -hmm. He's the only one that can do that. And when he knows that, okay, all the answers have been done, mm -hmm. well, this extra thing is going to happen. God had a willing group at Pentecost and he sent the Holy Spirit. He's waiting for a willing group to follow at whatever cost, and he'll send the latter rain. Mm -hmm. But Joanne, <coughs> in regards to, to bickering, we're coming toward the end of the world, and, and we're getting this shaking and so forth, and I'm on the right side. Won't I be witnessing to those, to others that I think are, am I just going to be silent here and, and not and not proclaiming what's right or what the truth is, what so forth. And I mean, isn't that going to be a type of bickering when I disagree with those who are, who are... Um, oh. I consider bickering when you're bickering about the Word of God, not when you're bickering with people who don't know the Word of God. Well, but won't that be, I mean, that, that it's going to be, won't that be the situation? Won't that be that you're going to have you're going to have the 144,000 saying, look, this is the right way. And you're going to have other people over here who, let's use the Seventh-day Adventist church, who are bona fide Seventh-day Adventist members, but they are disagreeing here with this. They think, no, this is what we ought to be doing. How, so how are you going? Trouble. That's right. Who's, how, do you, how, do you, how do you know what the bickering is? Ken, would yeah. you help us out of this? Well, <coughs> I, I'm thinking about this. Um, let's take the example of Jesus. Let's take the example of Jesus with the Samaritans. Now, the Jews and the Samaritans were at each other like something. In fact, in our handout for this time, if you, and if you'd like to get one of these, they're, they're available on our website at theox.org. Why did the Jews and Samaritans seem to hate each other so much? Who were the Samaritans? They were named after their capital city, Samaria. When the Assyrians, these are the people whose headquarters was at Nineveh, conquered the northern kingdom of Israel in 722, 723 BC, they removed many of the people who lived there and scattered them into other areas around the Assyrian Empire. At the same time, they brought people from those different areas and settled them into Palestine where the former Israelites had lived. The few Israelites who were remaining um, had little religious background to keep them faithful. And the new people who came in came with their idols and different gods. Because it was believed in those days that a certain god was assigned to each geographical area in the world, the newcomers actually asked the Assyrian leaders to send them a priest to come to Palestine and teach them about the god of that place so they could worship the god of that place so he could bless them and their crops would grow, etc. Approximately a hundred years later, when the Jews came back from Babylonian captivity, the Samaritans wanted to join them in building the new temple. The whole story is in Ezra 4, that particular part of the story. The Jews rejected the Samaritans' offer because they recognized that the Samaritans' religion was already corrupted. This led to the Samaritans doing everything they could possibly do to hinder the progress of the Jews rebuilding their homeland. Eventually, the Samaritans set up a rival center of worship on Mount Gerizim. 
Around the year 125 BC, John Hyrcanus, who was the leader, a sort of military leader of the Jews at that point in time, attacked Samaria and destroyed their temple. This led to so much animosity that usually the Jews traveling from, see, here's Judea down here, and straight above it is Samaria, I mean, straight above it, well, Samaria in the middle, and straight above that is Galilee, and the Jews need to get from Judea to Galilee, and it was so, the Samar animosity with the Samaritans was so bad that the Jews would travel across the Jordan River, let's see, if I'm doing it for you, it would be this way, <laughs> yeah, cross the Jordan River down by Jericho, travel up through Perea, and then cross the Jordan River again to get back into Galilee instead of traveling through Samaria. But what did Jesus do? He walked right through. He walked right through on more than one occasion. And this is the story of what happened when he did that. Look at John chapter 4. And Jesus gave us a good example. We don't have time to read the whole story, but you know, he came to that well and he sat down there and his disciples went into town to find food. And a woman came with a, in the middle of the day with an empty pitcher. A Samaritan woman. A Samaritan woman. And what did Jesus do? Well, the first thing he said, uh, could you give me a drink? So he got her attention. He got her interested so that she asked him a question. How is it the Jew, being a Jew, ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? Now, maybe with a little bit of history we just gave you, that would be a little easier to understand why that would be a, an issue. And she says, you know, you Jews don't even, are not even willing to drink from the same cups and use the same dishes that we Samaritans use. He created desire, he said, in her, she said, Sir, remember we talked about the living water, give me this water. So now she says, I, I want something that you apparently have. See, she created desire. Then he brought a conviction to her heart, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Five, the woman acted on her conviction, saying to others, Come and see a man who told me all things that I ever did. Could this be the Christ? So you see the sequence there. Create an interest, you know, ask a question, create an interest, follow up on that interest, offer something, convince, convince them, convict them to do something, and they go forth and do something. This so is, the is, kind of is, thing the, is this story and and the interaction Jesus had with this woman is this a uh, is this evangelism technique? Yes. <coughs> how many how many people of the world do we have casual contact with every day? Now, it depends on what we do, obviously, but all of us have casual contacts with people at one time or another. Do we ever take advantage of those casual contacts? to reach out for the gospel's be for, the, for the sake of the gospel. Mm, pitifully few times. Pitifully few times. And what did Jesus do? He said, you have a need. I have a need. I need water. You need water too. But you have an even greater need, a much greater need. You need salvation. You need Jesus Christ and I am He. It's amazing that Jesus early in His ministry, very early in His ministry, just bluntly told this Samaritan woman that he was the Messiah. He didn't tell the Jews that till a long time later. Even his disciples. And he didn't tell his disciples, he asked them, well, who, who do you think I am? You know? Very interesting. You, we, we, would, we would all say that under normal circumstances, trying to get a drink of water is a very, considered a very casual, brief incident. We don't expect to spend a long period of time. Now, I spent many years in Africa where getting a drink of water was a major challenge. I mean, you could walk three or four miles to get to a small <coughs> stream and you have to sometimes dig a hole so that you'd collect enough water in there so you could actually scoop it out and then you got to carry it back on your head. And of course, you ladies are the one who would have to do that. We men are way too important to spend our time carrying water around. We're chasing mosquitoes and We're lions. Chasing, yeah, <laughs> things like that, yeah. Well, but what about this? In these casual contexts, is there an opportunity to witness somehow or other? Desire of Ages 339 says, It is in working to spread the good news of salvation that we are brought near to the Savior. Mm -hmm. You know, in our so last... There is a, there is a role for, for this individual work. Mm -hmm. You know, in our last, last lesson, mm -hmm. <clears throat> we looked at um, some strategies for 
for teamwork. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> I'm going to be getting on an airplane mm -hmm. here in a few weeks. and So I'm going to be sitting next to somebody. Mm -hmm. So if I'm taking this lesson to heart here, would it be good for me to kind of lay a little strategy and a little plan and maybe think up some questions I might ask or, of course, the questions are easy. It's the answers. And then when they ask their questions, and I've got to come up with answers, but. Well, here, here's my, my response to that. What do you think Jesus would do? The what night did before, he he'd have been in prayer. What would he That's a good point. He spent the night in prayer the night before, and then, like this encounter with the Samaritan woman, he asked questions. Mm -hmm. But what would Jesus have done if the Samaritan woman stuck her nose up in the air and avoided him? Well, on that one question, that the first case, question. Yeah. In the case of Jesus, I think he already knew the answer to that. That may, we no, may not I be think able there's to a do. method there, because yeah. you have to first see if the guy, whoever you're talking to, will open up to you. Mm -hmm. And you can't just sit down and start forcing things on them. They'll just get up and leave. I mean, that's the way it goes. But these, so, these people that Jay is talking about, they're buckled in. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, I'm, and I'm sitting on the aisle so they can't. Well, you don't want to be the I type of person down. where they'll say, stewardess, can I have another seat? I got to get, <laughs> get away from this guy. You know, you don't want to do that either. But, I mean, seriously, now, how do we, how, what do we say to people we have casual contact with? That's the question. Yeah, what, what questions should I ask this person next to me? I think it's a little easier when you're older. You, if you travel enough, you can figure out just by watching what they do with their immediate environment, what they're reading maybe, be it a newspaper. There's usually something that can trigger Shoot something of interest. So you're pretty good at that, are you? I didn't say that. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> what I'm saying is you can figure what tends to be someone's interest or disinterest. Yeah. Well, but I think even, pick up on. even that is a time for prayer. Yeah. I, um, I have some friends who did an experiment. And they went to England which is a country where there's very little knowledge of God. In fact, they seem to be doing everything they possibly can to, to put God, the knowledge of God out of their, out of their thinking. But they, these friends of mine who went there and talked to some of those people discovered that if you talk to them about church, they don't want to have, they're not, they won't give you the time of day. They don't have anything to do with church. But if you ask them about God, that's another story. Oh yeah, they're ready to talk about God. So that would be my first suggestion. Say to someone, depending on what they're doing, says, you know, what do you think about God? Whew, that's a pretty loaded question. <laughs> <laughs> that's, the, that's the kind of question you want to ask. And pretty well everybody, be it a, a, a believer or unbeliever, you can just bring up about the news. Yeah. Did you hear the news before you got in? Such and such happened, or they just blew up something back in Iraq again. Well, what if you can start something going fairly easy with that kind of thing? Well, it, one thing's for sure: if you're really proud of what you believe, you're going to probably say something, mm -hmm. not to really push anything on them, but they're going to notice that you're very proud of this this spiritual knowledge that you have, and then they may start asking questions. Well, what do you think is so great about this anyway? And then you can start that way. But there, there needs to be something to just and open you, up the person and not force it on him. Getting started problem. is not the problem. It's yeah. following. And you, can al you always can say, well, you know, that's the reason I'm asking these questions. I'm trying to find these answers, these things myself. Yeah. I've had some very interesting talks, not a lot, with some of the mentally ill. One or two of them staggered me. Very sick people came back before we went to Scripture. All these places have a weekend scriptural service they can go to. And you realize that people have got more knowledge about things than you give them credit for. Mm -hmm. Somebody somewhere <coughs> gave them some knowledge. And we can never think that people don't understand some of this stuff. It's just prompting them. Mm -hmm. Well, people have a tendency to hide their spiritual side anyway. Not everybody, but I think there's a big 
group of people that do. And um, if you can give them some sort of like drawing the fish on the ground or something, yeah. you know, it'll, it'll, that can open up things also, you know. Well, when a new member comes to church, how do we get them established in the church as a regular attendee? Being friendly. Being friendly? Good potlucks. Things I've seen. Good potlucks? Mm -hmm. Yeah. In <laughs> interesting Sabbath schools where they are learning something. Mm hmm not friendly they don't come back yeah I, I can't help but feel Ken that one of the most productive things especially for somebody who is new and and maybe the Bible is very new mm -hmm. is to have um, <clears throat> a group uh, uh, once a week that gathers together for a Bible study and and um, they're welcome to come to that and develop uh, a fellowship and begin this this journey of through this this magnificent history here. And you know, our our group got started really by going through the Bible book by book, um, asking the one most important question of all we feel, and that's what does this book story or passage tell you about God? And I think that's a great way to have groups, and if. If you're not sure how to do that or get started at it, uh, on our website, uh, theox.org, that's T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G, you can look up handouts for almost every book in the Bible available there. Okay, here are the, some of the questions you could ask about this book and what it says about God. Um, and you, if you don't have something going like this uh, already, mm -hmm. um, you could gather together with... I don't know, five or ten people, maybe twelve people, that's a very good group, and start. Yeah. It doesn't have to be new converts, it's start no. this among you, and then once you get rolling, there is a, there is a place for these people to, Absolutely. to come. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So that would be a way of nurturing them, bring them in, establishing them into biblical truth. Um, we need to educate them, we need to teach them about the principles of Christianity. Uh, we, we need to get them to feel like they're part of the program. Um, there's an interesting sequences in the book of, well, mi primarily in the book of Acts, but, but look at these, these things. Look at, uh, start with Acts 2, verse 42. They spent their time in learning from the apostles, taking part in the fellowship, and sharing in their fellowship meals and the prayers. Learning from the apostles, taking part in the fellowship, sharing in the meals and the prayers. That sounds like a good way to go, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. And then, notice this very interesting thing. This is a verse we don't often look at. This is Acts 11, verse 19. Some of the, and if you, if you know the sequence here, what happened was three and a half years went by, and the Christians thought that the only people during those three and a half years, after Jesus was dead and gone, or, or you know, dead and then raised and gone back to heaven, um, they, they still thought their task was only to speak to Jews, just to convert Jews. And finally, when Stephen gave that speech in, in, in Acts 6, I'm sorry, the, the experience in Acts 6, but the speech is in Acts 7. And when, when he did that, of course, they, they stoned him. And that led to this horrendous breakout of persecution against Christians, and the Christians got scattered. What was the result? Well, look at Acts 11 now, starting with verse 19. Some of the believers who were scattered by the persecution which took place when Stephen was killed went as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch. This Antioch would be Antioch of Syria, the third largest city in the Roman Empire at that time, telling the message to Jews only. Notice those very important vo vo words. But other believers who were from Cyprus and Cyrene, now there's already missionaries coming from North Africa. Cyprus and Cyrene is what we would be modern, modern Libya. These people from Libya came across to Antioch and proclaimed the message to Gentiles also, telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. Now, it's important to recognize for all of us who are Gentiles that 
This is the first time, as far as we know, as far as we have recorded in record, that there was an intentional attempt to evangelize Gentiles. The first time there's an intentional attempt and to evangelize And it came from Gentile country. And it came from a Gentile country. Well, they were, they were Jews. Yeah, but, but they had, they had lived yeah. down in Gentile. They right. lived outside of Judea. They lived right. down in North Africa. Right. And now they're going across to Syria. They went, they went from Libya to Syria <coughs> <laughs> to, to preach the gospel. And they, they said, we're not going to restrict ourselves to just Jews. We're going to tell it to everybody. And the, the Lord's power was with them, and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. Do you think the Holy Spirit was at, was in, at work there? Absolutely. Yeah. The news about this reached the church in Jerusalem, so they sent Barnabas to Antioch when he arrived and saw how God had blessed the people, and he was glad and urged them all to be faithful and true to the Lord with all their hearts. Barnabas was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit with all their uh, and faith, and many people were brought to the Lord. Then Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. He said, we need more help here. When he found him, he took him to Antioch, and for a whole year the two met with the people of the church and taught a large group. It was at Antioch that the believers were first called Christians. And why were they called Christians? Followers of the Christ. Well, that's great in our day. That sounds like a wonderful thing. Originally, it was a derisive term. And th this is the pe those crazy people who are following a dead man. That's what their enemies said about them. Okay. Those are the crazy people who are following a dead man. But didn't Antioch become quite a center of Christianity? It was Barnabas and Paul's and Silas's home church. Yeah. Well, what is it that specifically leads a person to become an active member of the group and to stay active? Well, one thing, individually, they're compatible. Mm -hmm. I mean, if, if they had to <coughs> fight that all the time, they wouldn't stay very long. Yeah. Well, a recent study, research study was done to try to find out what it is that makes people stay and, and really become committed members of a church organization. And this is what was the findings were. And it, w it was discovered that there are three things, and you have to have at least two of those three to be a committed and faithful church member. So let's look at them very carefully. Number one, this person needs to believe in the church's teachings and doctrines. That's a help. That's help. <laughs> they need to believe in the church's teaching or doctrines. Number two, now that should be, number one should be obvious. Number two, that person needs to make friends in the church and feel close to them. They need to feel like they're a part of the group. Okay, that's number two. Now, you only need two out of three. And number three, that person needs to become involved in the church's programs. They need to feel a part of what's going on. So any two, you don't even have to be absolutely committed to the church's programs. If, you're, if you feel like there's friends in the church that you, you really want to be with and you're a part of the program, you may, you may not even be too sure about the doctrines, but you're going to stick by. Let me go over those three again. One. You need to believe in the church's teachings and doctrines. Two, you need to make friends in the church and feel close to them. Three, you need to become involved in the church's programs. And uh, two. So okay. all three of those uh, could be basically a social thing. Yes, to a certain extent. So what, what happens in the shaking time if, you, if, you're, if you're working well with the last two, but you're not heavy into the church doctrine? Well, there's no guarantee that these things will, will, will make you, will get you. Maybe you have to have all three to make it through the shaking time. <laughs> That's probably the case. Well, I, I would think you'd have to have the first one. Now, does this, is this, is this derived from folks who are members of, would they survey folks at these mega churches, or did they I, I survey the Quakers here? I need to, I need to, uh, to go and, and find out a little bit more about the, the groups and whatever. I'm just saying that this is a report that came. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, if you don't have number one, that you believe in the church's doctrines, <clears throat> I've, run, I've belonged uh, or attended several churches where there are friends in the church 
and it was easy to become involved in the church, but their teachings were, just did not jive. And so the search continued. So I would disagree with whoever did that recent survey that only two of the three, I think one is mandatory and then maybe um, one of the other two. Yeah. Well, that's for you. Well, this may be oh. speaking from yeah. the beginning. You know, you had a desire to learn something more than just becoming friends. Well, I think we have to credit people with why do you belong to a church? It's because you believe what they say. I mean, I, I, all people go into it. You know, there are they're looking yeah. for a social. They're just looking for a group. Somebody, yeah. A social group. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Economic, maybe their economic well-being of the culture, they get pro progress, uh, advancement. And a person, if they're satisfied ec uh, economically and, and uh, emotionally and whatever, why should they look around? If they're happy there, it's a, it's, it's a great thing well, to... Well, unfortunately, there aren't more like Joanne who's looking for I something. understand that. I'm not, I'm, I'm not advocating what I said. I, I just, uh, that's an yeah, observation. Sure. That's the old philosophy. If you're not well off financially, if you're not well off health-wise, God must not be smiling on you. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's, it's not true, but that's, that's the thinking that I've observed. No, so let me ask this question. Does your church or even your Sabbath school class or some smaller group within your Sabbath school class have an intentional program to cement new members into the faith? Well, hopefully what we've been doing from with your efforts and, and study guides and everything. Uh, but we don't think like the, the great uh, bunch of them do. It's, uh, uh, we're kind of a, a fringe group, so to speak, from the standpoint uh, we, we have the great controversy understanding. Mm -hmm. And you ask most, most uh, members, they don't understand what that means. They don't, you ask them where sin began, oh, Adam, no, maybe Eve. No, it didn't really begin with Lucifer in heaven, God's first greatest creation. You and know, then, now you're shifting paradigms. I think like at the high school, who cements people in the group is often the drug culture or cultures that are doing something wrong have a better evangelistic and maintaining friendship and keep you in than the good kids that just maybe ignore the other kids. And sometimes getting into a church is more uh, stamina of withstanding non-friendly people, but then you believe what they believe in. And I mean, a bar can be more friendly than a church. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, I don't think churches concentrate on holding people in yeah. like maybe the drug culture does or some of these other cultures they seem to have, uh, they more cement their people in. Do you know what I mean? Well, often, often church programs mm -hmm. or probably other kind of programs as well get started around a single individual who has a burden. That person may put in a great deal of effort to get things started and to establish the basics of the program. But sooner or later, that person will need to hand over at least some of the responsibilities to others. We live in a highly mobile society. People move around. Maybe they have to change jobs and, and they have to move to, to, to where their new job is. More than that, if the church is growing, new groups need to be started. So how do we go about training new leaders, getting new groups started, etc.? Paul had some words to say to Timothy. Look at 2 Timothy 2, starting with verse 1. As for you, my son, be strong through the grace that is ours in union with Christ Jesus. Take the teachings that you heard me proclaim in the presence of many witnesses and entrust them to reliable people who will be able to teach others also. So what's Paul telling Timothy to do? Train trainers. And evaluate. Mm -hmm. Take your part in suffering as a loyal soldier of Christ. A soldier on active service wants to please his commanding officer and so does not get mixed up in the affairs of civilian life. An athlete who runs in a race cannot win the prize unless he obeys the rules. The farmer who has done the hard work should have the first share of the harvest. Think about what I'm saying because the Lord will enable you to understand it 
all. Okay? What's Paul saying? Paul recognized that Timothy could not do all the work himself. He had to teach others and he should he must choose reliable, responsible people, teach them, and they can in turn teach others. How well are we doing at that within our churches? Does it happen in our Sabbath school class? Does it happen in our church? This was when Timothy was a leader of a church. Is that right? A young leader of well, a church? Well, this is when Paul had been in prison for already four, about four years. And Timothy was out and he was, he was trying to carry on the work the best he could. And uh, apparently Paul left Timothy down in Cyprus. And then later he asked him to move to another place. But he was, he was Paul's surrogate. Yeah. You know, you keep talking about teaching, teaching, teaching. Mm -hmm. Is there a place for a person's talents in the church where they can fit in there? To sing also? or play a musical instrument or what? Sing, play a musical instrument, organizational skills, um, planning skills, sure. all those things. Yeah. Um, so there's... There's a lot sure, of things that you can fit in and yeah. then you'll value it. We talked about that in an earlier lesson. Yeah. <coughs> Unfortunately, the Christian vocabulary includes, includes the word backslider. Occasionally, people leave the Adventist church because they disagree with our teachings. But far more often, it is because there's a personal misunderstanding, a disagreement, a disenchantment, or a discouragement that leads to the leaving. We need to recognize that just as people are gradually brought in, convinced to become church members, in general, they gradually leave. We need to be looking around at others in the church and trying to assist them if they seem to be having trouble with their Christian experience. I think that's probably why Paul said what he did in Galatians 6 verse 2, help to carry one another's burdens. And in this way, you will obey the law of Christ. Surely we ought to do that, a better job at that. If someone does not come to church or Sabbath school for a few weeks, do we call them up? Do we try to visit them? Do we encourage them to return? Well, read 2 Corinthians 5, 18 to 20. All this done, and I'm reading from my Good News Bible, which will be quite different than some translations. There's a lot of variation in these passages. All this is done by God, who through Christ changed us from enemies into his friends. And that's, in the original version, it says reconciled. And gave us the task of making others his friends also. So God reconciles us, and then what is it he wants us to do? He wants us to win others, right? We are supposed to be ambassadors for Christ. God did not keep an account of their sins, and he has given us the message which tells how he makes them his friends. Here we are then, speaking for Christ. That makes us an ambassador, right? Speaking for Christ. Actually, the ancient Hebrew word is prophet, someone who speaks on behalf of someone else. We, here we are, speaking for Christ, as though God himself were making his appeal to us. We plead on Christ's behalf, let God change you from enemies into his friends. In other words, when we get <clears throat> a precious gift from God, we're not to keep it to ourselves. We're to share it with others. Mm -hmm. So when we have this, this basic message, when we think we understand the gospel, and that would be the first step, we need to understand the gospel ourselves, and we need to get to the place, hopefully, like Paul, we can say, even if an angel from heaven disagrees with me, he's wrong, Galatians 1, 8 and 9. We are to speak for God. Many translations in this, these passages use reconcile. Reconcile implies that once there was a relationship, but now it is broken or stretched thin. And that relationship needs to be reestablished. Look at Matthew 10, 5 and 6 as another suggestion. These 12 men were sent out. This, of course, we're talking about the disciples. These 12 men were sent out by Jesus with the following instructions. Do not go to any Gentile territory or any Samaritan towns. Instead, you are to go to the lost sheep of the people of Israel. The lost sheep, what would that imply? Backsliders? Maybe. People, Jews who weren't doing their job, right? Who, weren't, who, 
who still hadn't, you know, recognized the original call that God had given to the Jewish people. Would Samaritans be considered part of the lost sheep of Israel? Mm. Well, in initially, <coughs> no, but maybe later, yes. So this actually sounds like Jesus is playing into their prejudices already to just evangelize the Jews, just take the message to the Jews. And why would he say that? Who was he speaking to? Well, he was speaking to he, the Jews. He was but speaking to people who weren't, wouldn't even have considered doing anything else at that point in time. And also, if uh, the Jews may not have considered it, if the Samaritans and Gentiles had been part of the right. church. Yeah, if you, if you got to win. The way things were in those days, if you didn't win the Jews first, to, to, if, they, if you had already brought Gentiles into the program, you try to turn around and win a Jew, and you're, you can't even go to the synagogue. Now, are you saying that Jesus takes it easy with us? Mm -hmm. he, he doesn't... He reaches us where we are. He, he has us grow and grow and grow into his final uh, goal for us? Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, as, as we know, sometimes the church has major programs to bring people in. And they come in, and before too long, it seems like they've disappeared again. We call that the back door. Often it suggests that people enter through the front door and then unfortunately sometimes fairly quickly exit through the back door. Why is that? Well, you know, that's not really bad because even in advertisement, what people need to hear things three or four times before they understand it. And mm -hmm. so if they come into the church, well, they've understood something. So it's just if we keep that going, uh, maybe after three meetings, it'll finally become clear to them. Okay, if, they, if they're ready to go through the front door again, huh? Yeah. Some people find that being a Christian causes a bigger change in their lifestyle and thinking that they are, than they are prepared to make. Mm -hmm. Some find one or more reasons why they do not like the pastor or the congregation <coughs> or even taking the time out of their busy schedule. I did that when <clears throat> I would hear a preacher and say, all you need to be, do to be saved is believe on the name of Jesus. Mm -hmm. And then he started wanting me to change this and change that and change that. And I was like, wait a minute, you, that's false advertising. At first you said it was just this. So I think we should tell people that God has a way of life that's better for you, that will make you the person you were designed to be. And this is the beginning. And this is the beginning of a journey you're going to be on. But to tell people that you don't need to change in order to be Christian is false advertising. Now, yeah. now, what about churches that have different characters? I mean, some churches mm -hmm. are more blue collar, some are more white collar, some are, have more doctors in them, some sure. have more this, that, or the other thing. What if you're in a town that has a church that has people that you normally wouldn't associate with? Um, Whereas if you were in a bigger town, there might be another church that has a different type of character. Is that, could that be a problem, or is that your problem when that, that happens? Well, it could be a problem, and what, do you, what, I mean, what should you do about that? Should I? You, either, you either learn to adapt, or you try to pull some more people in, into the church that are like you. Well, I, I remember there was one friend of mine that was interested in my church, and I knew him pretty well, and I thought, I don't think you ought to go to this one. Maybe you ought to go to this one. Even though I go to this one, he should go to this one. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, kind of pointed him over there. And yeah. Mm -hmm. I think we need to learn to rub shoulders with most folks from most walks of life. And it's not easy. But mm -hmm. Christ did it, and we need to look at that. And I, I still get back, if you've ever been through a church, and I'm sure I'm not just speaking for myself, depends somewhat on the greeting you get at the front door. Mm -hmm. and I've been through one or two churches I would never go back again. Mm -hmm. It's just dead. Are we kind and loving and caring, especially to those who are finding it hard to maintain their Christianity? Churches cannot reach out and put their arm around an individual, but individuals can. Caring churches are places that are full of caring people. It is the caring people that make, it, that make a difference. Are we that kind of Christian? So how can we make witnessing and evangelism an ongoing major part of our church program? Here are some suggestions. This is, you, you get the general idea here from, from our, the Bible study guide page 
uh, for Friday of June 29, make sure that leadership is shared so that the team does not become a one-person band. Two, report back to the larger church group what is happening in your team. Let them see that the gospel is winning. New members are making progress. This can be done through announcements in the bulletin, newsletters, even posters. Be constantly on the lookout for people who you think could become involved in your team or perhaps even start a similar team. Occasionally, pay people may approach you and ask how they can become a member of your team. But much more commonly, people need to be invited. They need to be, you need to speak to them, say, you know, I, I would really appreciate it if you'd join us. Can you do this? Can you do this? Would you be willing to help us for a little while? And then if they get involved and so forth, they may stick by. When people are ready to join a team, they need to be given clear training and instructions so that they feel comfortable in what they're expected to do. And, and then if a person in your group or church seems to be slipping back, do we love and care for him or her? Or do we read to them passages from the Bible or quotations from Ellen White condemning their behavior? I hear somebody chuckling. They've had some experiences. Do we do everything we can to make a, the program we are involved in as interesting and attractive as possible? Do we try to nurture people who come in? Do we make them feel like they are part of the group? How can we reach out and put an arm around those who seem to be sliding back? What are some of the best ways to foster friendship among the group and especially to incorporate new members? When it comes to witnessing or evangelism, the most active and effective people are those who have a vibrant, active, personal relationship with God. We need to be constantly aware of the fact that we are in an all-out warfare with the devil. Read Ephesians 6.12. We are trying to teach people who are naturally selfish. Here's the challenge. We're trying to teach people who are naturally selfish to instead become naturally loving. This is an uphill battle. Amen. In this series of lessons, we have focused on the fact that in order to be really successful, the Christian Church and the Adventist Church must have an external focus. While we want to do everything possible to build up the church itself, we must also be reaching out and trying to bring in others from the community. How are we as a Sabbath school class doing in reaching out to others? How are you doing in your Sabbath school class? If we believe that our great controversial orientation is a message that the Adventist Church needs to understand, and that would be something really important to all of us here. Um, what are we doing to, to get that message out to the other groups or invite them to join our group? Would that be a valid form of witnessing or evangelism? Try it yourself. Thanks for listening.